Okay, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Those of you that are joining the class, I have uh, um, a couple announcements. Um, we are in week eight already, guys. So you have this week and next week for teaching, and then that will be it. And you have your celebration of learning week, and then that's it for this cycle. And then you will be getting your report cards. All right. Um, those of you that have missing grades, I have been messaging every single week. If you don't submit it by Friday, 2 o'clock, I send a message to everyone that has not submitted their assignments to remind you that your assignments are due. So um, according to my grades for Belizean Studies Online, Belizean Studies Online, I have one, two three, four, five, six, seven, seven students that are failing out of 30, out of 30, I have seven students that are failing, which is not bad overall. If I look at it as a class level, it's not that bad, but um, for those students that are failing, you are failing. And when I mean that you are failing, you are failing in the 60s, in between the 60s and a 20%. So the lowest grade at the moment is like a 27%. Uh, because I have so many missing assignments. Um, the assignments are still open. You can still submit your assignments. I encourage everyone to submit their missing assignments. If you would like to redo an assignment, you are free to redo an assignment. Um, but it has to be during this week. Because after this Friday, I will no longer be accepting late work because next week I really want to finish grading so that I can concentrate on grading your final um, activities for the celebration of learning. All right. Um, I do try my best to check the activities either Fridays or Saturdays and give you guys feedback so that you know where it is that you stand. And I do give you guys in the comments that you know what I expected if you did not give me what I expected you guys to do for the assignment. So if anybody would like to redo anything or has missing work, you have until this Friday to do so, along with the assignments for this week. Not because you are going to be doing your missing work and you're going to be doing all of those things means that you're not going to give me the work for this week. You still have to give me the work that is due this Friday. So I'm giving you guys today is Tuesday. You have today, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday. It's up four days to do that if you would like to do that. If I don't get anything from you Friday, then I just fill in the grade book with zeros. And, and then that will be it. Um, so that is in regards to grades and your performance in there. Next cycle, it's more than likely I think that I will be co-teaching with Miss Ton or or she will be taking over. I was just doing the Belizean studies for this cycle to assist her with her workload, but all depends um, if I will assist her or if she will be taking over. So maybe that will be a change for next cycle. Um, so just letting you know in the case that next cycle comes and then I'm not teaching you anymore. Um, the I would like for you guys to check the attendance because in your report card, the attendance will show up. So if I have you absent for a session and you should be present, you feel free to let me know and then I can check it and go back to fix it because your report card will be having how many sessions for Belizean studies you attended and how many you did not attend. So it's always good to go back and check because that will be in your record for forever until you leave Carnes and that will be your record. So go ahead and check that. All right. Um, the assignment roster as well. Check the assignment roster to see that if you submitted an assignment, I have it checked that you did submit it. So it's always good to go back and check those records because those will be the school records. So whatever, everything that is posted in the student records section, um, go back and check it to so make sure that the information I have there is correct. 
If it is highlighted in yellow, it means that it was submitted late. If it's highlighted in a mint color, that means that I have not received it as yet. All right. So go back and check it. If you have any questions, feel free to message me. I am free every single day after 11.30. I am basically free because all of my classes are in the morning. So if you message me in the afternoon, I will be there to respond, you guys. So go ahead and do that when you have a free time today. Um, because I want to have all my records straightened out, clear, correct with all of you. So that when you guys see a report card, it's not a surprise what is there. All right? So those are my announcements. I don't think that I'm forgetting anything. So um, let's begin with today's class. Um, oh, I know that last week, not everybody could join the Thursday session, but I did upload the recording. But I saw that most of you did the first assignment with the information from the first session, and that was very good. Still worked out, still got um, a good grade. Um, do you want me to say in front of the entire class how you are doing? Because I see you're asking in the chat. I don't think that that would be a good idea uh, for me to share how you are doing in front of everybody. So I, you can message me privately later on, and then I will respond to you privately. All right. So we are continuing with our unit, which is delving into God's unique Belizean servant. And my deep hope, as we have been working in the past two weeks, we're basically talking about the diverse cultures that Belize has. We talked about language last week. We were targeting the Maya traditions and rituals. And this week, we're targeting another culture. Um, when it comes to the creation, fall, redemption, restoration, um, we have talked about how um, we were created in the image of God. Humans are not perfect. We are not perfect. We were created perfect at some point, but after sin and after the fall, that perfect image that God created in us was tarnished and distorted to some extent. And now when it comes to redeeming ourselves and restoring ourselves, it's something that is from our end, right? We cannot be forced to love everyone, and it's very difficult to love everyone. And we cannot be forced to, to love everybody's differences. And it's not impossible either, but it's something that each one of us needs to work really, really hard to um, to do. All right? It's in the restoration here, I have Jesus said, love one another. He did not say to love the ones who look like us or the ones who act like us. Or the ones who speak like us. He simply said love. And loving is a choice. Right? If we if you love your classmates, if you love your um your neighbor, if you love any human being, you love them as they are. It's not because okay, this one looks like looks like me, my same skin color from my same ethnic culture. That's why I'm gonna love this person. This person speaks like me, so I'm going to love this person. And these are things that we talked about when it came to language and when it came to the culture. We talked about the Mayas last week where the parents wanted their sons to marry somebody from the same social class, right? So what were they saying? We're only, we're only going to love the ones that come from the same social class as us, not anybody else, right? So all of these things are very difficult for us to do, but we have to put our part to accomplish them, to work on them, and each day grow a little bit more closer to attaining that goal. And the unit objectives, we are still working in the contrast between traditional practices and cultural practices, um, the beliefs and the practices of a culture. This week, we are looking into a different culture in the, in the Belize, um, in the country of Belize. And it's going to take us one step closer to the, to being able to answer our essential question, which, me, which is, what does it mean to be a Belizean? So we talked about language. We talked about one culture last week, and we're going to talk about another culture this week. And when we finish off next week, then we're supposed to have an answer. Based on the four-week content, then we're supposed to reach an answer to this specific question. So now, what culture are we talking about today and for this week? Um, we want to identify the main cultural practice of the East Indian culture. We want to distinguish between the East Indian religion and Christianity. And we want to describe some of the main East Indian cultural practices. So the culture that we're talking about today is basically the East Indians. 
but before i go into actually what the content is i want to um explain the assignments all right let me share you guys the assignments okay so this is the first one the assignments for this week are a little bit similar to the assignments from last week similar not exactly the same um, the first one says that students will identify and write three ideas that were discussed and then write what your initial thoughts for each one. That was similar to the first one we did last week. But along with that, students will then write three questions you now have after the discussion. And you could do this after today's class. Um, because today we're basically going to be covering um, all of the practices, the major practices and the beliefs. So... You are going to identify three things, um, three things that you that caught your attention today and what was your initial thought on them. And then you choose either the round bubbles or the cloud shaped bubbles and you write it there. And then in the other three bubbles, you're going to write three questions and they could be very simple questions. Um, like where did this come from or where did they get this idea? Or um, what do they do for this? Simple, simple things that I could ask who, what, where, when. Simple questions, right? If you would like to have a higher, more higher order question, then that's completely up to you. But this is the first assignment. Three things that caught your attention and what you thought about it. And then three questions that you now have after today's class. So this is the first assignment. The second assignment is what we will be um, discussing ne next class, discussing on Thursday, which is the difference between the Islam religion and Christianity. So students will complete the following graphic organizer with three similarities and three differences between the Islam and Christianity. And I do have the graphic organizer here with you. So three things that are different you're gonna have three differences in their islam three differences in their christianity and then three ways how islam and christianity are alike and then we're gonna talk about this next class as i mentioned so after today's class you will be able to accomplish the first assignment without any um issues i would hope and then next class we will be able to accomplish the second assignment so those are the two assignments for this week so now moving back to um, the topic, what is our lesson about today? And it's the East Indian cultural practices. So first you want to talk about the East Indians and beliefs. Um, and it is one of the smallest but most vibrant communities in Belize that, and we call this the East Indian. Now East Indian <clears throat> is the correct name for this culture. We do not call them Hindu or the Hindi. Hindu is the name of a religion, but we like to use the word Hindu to refer to these people, and that is not the correct way to refer to them. They are East Indians, right? That is their culture. Their religion is something else. Hindu is also a religion that comes from the Middle East, but it is not the religion that all east indians practice some east indians practice the hindu religion other east indians practice the islam religion but um east indian is the correct way to refer to this specific culture all right so now the indian subcontinent now home to more than billions of people was long coveted by the europeans for its abundance of silk spices and other luxury items now how do we know this how do we know that europe wanted india so badly well if we remember the um the story of christopher columbus christopher columbus intended location was to go to india his mission was to go to india to create a route for trade so that was his voyage. The mission that was given to him was for him to go to India, um, create a route where it could be easier for trade to happen between Europe 
and the Middle East and where the trade could easily happen. So that was the intended, um, the intended voyage for Christopher Columbus. But that did not happen. Christopher Columbus did not make it to India. Instead, he landed on another continent and uh, which we now call the Caribbean Sea. So he landed on this other hemisphere, right? And the first islands that he encountered, um, the people there, he thought that they were Indians and he called them Indians. Now, if you want to learn more about history, back then in the in the islands of the Caribbean, there were two races. There were the Tainos and the Kalinagos. The Tainos were more of a, like a gentle, more calm. They were fishermen. They didn't really do, um, they didn't really have any, any way of, you know, like if a war would come, they would defend themselves. They were a very calm um, group of people. On the other hand, there were the Kalinagos. The Kalinagos were more aggressive people. They were hunters. Um, some people believed that they were cannibals, that they would capture some Tainos and they would eat them. It was, uh, it's a whole other topic to talk about those things. But in that time where you have the Mayas, you also had the Tainos and the Kalinagos living in the Caribbean islands. So when Christopher Columbus, he first landed on one of these islands, because to get to Central America, you have to reach the islands first, right? You have to cross if you're coming down from Europe. So he landed on one of the islands and he thought that the Tainos and the Kalinagos were Indian people and he called them Indians. And now based on that, Based on the fact that he called them Indians, the Caribbean was at some point referred to as the West Indies. And um, if you, there is, the, for example, the West Indies University, um, because they it was created back then when still they referred to the Caribbean islands as the West Indies. And I have a picture right here where you have the Greater Antilles and the Lesser Antilles, all of these, all of the Caribbean islands were referred to as the West Indies at some point. And then the name was changed to the Caribbean, Caribbean islands. The Tainos lived in the Greater Antilles and the Kalinagos lived in the Lesser Antilles. So now if we're coming down from, um, from Europe, you have to pass through the islands or land on one of the islands before you can get to the mainland. And that was what happened with Christopher Columbus. He traveled west thinking that it would be a faster way to reach to India. Um, but instead of reaching to India, he ended up in the Caribbean islands and he called these people Indians. So to him, he was in India, even though he was actually in the Caribbean. The East Indian population of Belize has struggled to distinguish themselves from native Indians. And this is where the problem now happens, where you have um, no problem, um, Jeannie, where you have the East Indians and you have the West Indians. The West Indians, and if we're talking about the West Indians, everybody that lives in this part of the country would be referred to as, not the country, of the world would be referred to as the West Indians. Because we were we form part of the West Indies. We are in the Western Hemisphere. And if our names were not, if the country's names were not changed, everybody would be, instead of Belizean, we would be the West Indians. Because we are descendants of the the Indians that Christopher Columbus had uncovered. So now when the East Indians came to this part of the world now, there was a big confusion because now you have East Indians, which from the Eastern Hemisphere, and you have West Indians, which are from this part of the hemisphere. And they, they, it was a struggle to distinguish themselves because when you said Indians, the East Indians knew that they were Indians because they came from India. But the West Indians, the ones that Christopher Columbus had called Indians, then they weren't really Indians. That was just a name that was given to them, but that was a name that was given to them by the Europeans. So because that happened, then they that name just stuck with them. 
just like the West Indies, that was the name of the Caribbean for so many years. And because it, it was the West Indies, they were the West Indians. And when the East Indian came, then whoosh, that was a whole mixture because this, I was an Indian from East Indian. You are an Indian from the Caribbean. And when they talk about Indians, it was a whole lot of confusion because it, which Indians are you referring to? Are you referring to the to the ones that um to the foreigners that came from India or are you referring from the Indians that live here and actually from here? So that was a whole confusion that happened. And it took so much time for there to be a distinguish and for people to understand the difference between the East Indians and the West Indians or the Native Indians, right? Like we call them Native Americans, we call them Native Indians as well. So that was one issue that arose because of the whole Christopher Columbus voyage thing. The first arrival from the Indian subcontinent, and now we're talking about the East Indians, to Belize were brought in by the British to work alongside the Africans. So now, what's happening here now? We know that Africans were brought as slaves, but now, we're, now they're telling us that Indians were also brought to work alongside the Africans in the years after slavery was abolished. Now, working alongside, it does not necessarily mean that they were brought to work just like the Africans. No. The Indians came here as um, people that wanted to learn and people that wanted to create um, and to work, but not work in the way that Africans were made to work. Africans, even after slavery was abolished, they were still treated like slaves, right? It was now just illegal, but after so many years of you, of the whites treating the blacks as slaves, it was so difficult to get out of that culture, of, out, out of that practice. So now when they brought the East Indians, even though they said they're going to work alongside the Africans, the East Indians were still a little bit above the Africans. They did not do the same work that the Africans were doing. And when the East Indians came here, the East Indians quickly, they established um, industries, they, they made businesses, they hired people, and they created this reputation in the Caribbean and Central America that they were people that knew how to make money and knew how to make businesses. And even if you look at the, the East Indians today, all, if not most, East Indians own some sort of business. And it's mostly business that have to do with in the clothing industry. Do you have, um, I haven't really seen here in Carazal, except in the free zone, where you have most of the businesses being owned by East Indians. If you go to Orange Walk and you walk into, um, for example, if you've been to Orange Walk in the park, on one side, almost all the little um, stores that are on one side of the park, almost all of them are owned by East Indians. And they sell clothing and they sell shoes. And um, in Belize City, it's the same thing. You walk into a store that sells clothing, more than likely you're going to meet up with somebody that is of the East Indian race. And that was, they have established that reputation from many years ago, that they are a culture that knows about making money and is an industrial and thrifty race. So, and yes, like the free zone, most of the, I think, I don't really go to the free zone. I've went to the free zone like three times, I think. Um, but in the stores that I have walked into in the free zone, um, most of them were owned by East Indian people. And that just proves that even though this was this started in the 1870s, so many years ago, and now we are in the 2021, and still the East Indian uh, race, the East Indian culture is one of the cultures that has the most businesses when it comes to that area of expertise, especially clothing and shoes and so forth. Um, and then you look at the Belizeans, Belizeans, the Mestizos, um, the Mayas. Um, is it, it's rare to see a store that is owned by a Mestizo. Or, um, or somebody of the Mestizo or Mayan descent. Um, you don't really see that happening. Um, 
So, although many of the first arrivals from the Indian subcontinent were brought into work on the vast plantation estates, most of them soon branched off into pursuing entrepreneurial activities. And this just reinforced what I was saying. They were brought here to, to work, um, but for some reason, they, they, they discontinued that. They stopped working for other people and they started to just branch off and create their own business and it did not go any in, in any way wrong for them because up to today they are still one of the cultures and we can see it here in belize that owns most of the businesses so now we're gonna move into talking about some of their practices cultural practices and the first one is the namaste who knows what is namaste Anybody? Have you seen somebody do it or do you do it yourself? No idea? Now, namaste was um, something that was uh, only the East Indian culture would do this. But now you have more people doing it. People that are not even East Indian. If you have seen um, news, I have seen Barack Obama. He does it. I have seen... Um, Prince Harry, he does it. Um, and let me show you guys what it is. The namaste is when you greet somebody, but you put your hands together and then you bow, right? Um, it is something that was only exclusive to the East Indian culture. Only the East Indians would do it, but now more people are doing it, even though they are not really East Indian. So this is the first cultural practice of the East Indians. Now, the Namaste is one of the most popular Indian customs and isn't just restricted to the Indian territory anymore. The Namaste, a Namaskar, um, that's how the East Indian, I, I don't think that I pronounced it correctly, but that's how you spell it in the East Indian um, when they're talking about it. It is one of the five forms of traditionally greeting mentioned in the ancient Hindu scriptures, the Vendas. Now, Namaste is just a way of greeting people and it's one of the most popular and most recognized. Namaste translates to I bow to you and greeting one another with it is a way of saying may our minds meet, indicated by folding your palms before the chest. The word namaha can also be translated as nama, not mine, to signify the reductions of one's ego in the presence of each other. So now, what do they mean when they do namaste? It is to greet somebody, just like how, like in the American culture, ni shake hands, um, or you hug, um, or if, if for example in in the belizean culture they like nod your head and then you know like that's a way of saying hi or hello or whatever um but in the east indian culture the uh, one of the five ways to greet is to do the namaste and the namaste is you basically put your hands together in front of your chest and you bow to somebody and that bowing is just saying i am not better than you if the other person does it as well they are doing the same thing but it just signifies that i don't have we're gonna have a conversation we're gonna work together we're gonna do something together we're gonna be together but during this time that we're together my ego is not gonna be um any bigger than yours i'm not gonna behave as if i'm better or if i know more we are equal right now so that was what the namaste represents for them now talking about their family structure east indians have an ex a joint um joint family structure extended family structure where you have entire families living together so you have the parents, the wives, the children, the grandchildren, uncles, aunts, everybody. It's a big family of relatives that live together. And this is mostly because of the cohesive nature of the Indian society. 
and also they believe that when you, you know, that when you are with your family it's supposed to help you handling pressure and handling stress so um that's just one of the reasons but if you guys have seen um any movie that was created in India or India-based movie, most of these movies portray that you have grandparents, you have the parents, you might have the brothers or sisters of the parents, and then you have the children, everybody living together in one household. Um, but it's just um, their cultural practice. They believe that you're, if you're a family, you're supposed to live together, right? And it helps. For them, it helps to relieve stress, especially when somebody comes from work or when you might fall in debt. It just helps to relieve the issue to have your family around and you can have your family supporting you. The other one is the holy cow. So when we talk about the holy cow, we're literally talking about the cow here, the animal itself, the cow. Mm -hmm. The cow in the Indian culture is considered to be a holy animal. Um, the cow is worshipped as a maternal figure and is, the, the, in, is a depiction of the bounty of Mother Earth. So for them, the cow represents like um, other people believe in Mother Nature. So the cow represents that for them. The cow represents the mother earth. Represents. So the cow is the representation of everything that is in earth. So for them, the cow is a sacred animal. Um, and then when we talk about history, um, and I don't want to go deep into the history because I'm going to talk a lot when it comes to who Lord Krishna is and what all happened in that story. But um, Lord Krishna, who grew up as a cow herder, is often depicted as playing his flute among cows and gopis, which are milkmaids, like ladies that milk the cows, um, dancing to his tune. So when people are actually, and they have rituals and celebrations that they do to celebrate the cow, the holy cow. And they always refer back to Lord Krishna, who is which one of the rulers back in the day, um, for the East Indian culture. And this Lord Krishna grew up as a cow herder. So grew up on a farm, had several cows, and he had to take care of them, cow herder. And when they talk about depictions, and there are pictures of this on the internet as well, if you search Lord Krishna, it comes out as you have this, this person playing the flute, and you have so many cows and so many milk ladies there. Um, Lord Krishna is also known by the name of Jovinda, um, which translates to the friend and the protector of the cow. So the story for Lord Krishna is a very interesting story. You want to learn more, you can go ahead and look up Lord Krishna. Um, but now, the cow has been an auspicious significance in the Indian culture and even its religion. Even Lord Shiva's trusted vehicle in um, Nadi is the sacred bull, which the bull is also a relative to the cow. Um, they refer to the male as the bull and then the female is the cow. All right. But Lord Shiva is another Lord, um, ruler of the East Indian, also history story. Um, but when Lord Shiva would travel, his vehicle was a bull, was a form of a cow, not a vehicle like a car that we could drive, all right? Um, thus, feeding a cow or making contributions for cow shelters is of immense religious importance for India. So now, we have dog shelters and we have cat shelters. In India, they have cow shelters because the cow is a holy animal, all right? So now, the cows are a source of life-sustaining milk. Even the cow dung is an essential and energy-efficient source of fuel, especially in rural India. What is cow dung? Anybody knows? No, I... Let's see. Cow dung is 
is a pretty way of saying cow manure, right? Um, so the cow gives life-sustaining milk. So you have the milk maize, the deco milk, and everybody drinks milk. You more than like almost everybody ingests some source of milk on a daily basis so it's life sustaining but even apart from that the cow dung or the cow manure is essential and an energy efficient source um, especially in rural indians and even here in in belize people that do a lot of agriculture use manure from from cows, from horses, and they use that to produce energy and to fuel certain things. We don't really use it a lot here in Belize, but it's it's a source of energy when you talk about manure of animals. Um, so let's see. Now, killing the cow or consuming cow meat is considered to be a sin. Hence, several states in India have banned the law of have banned the slaughtering of cows by law. The mother cow is, however, not worshipped as a deity. So we have to have it clear. The cow is not a god for them. The cow is just a representation of nature. The cow represents nature and represents earth for them. They do not worship the cow. The cow is just a sacred animal. Like, for example... Um, in Christianity, um, we believe that the lamb is a sacred animal. Um, we don't worship the lamb. The lamb is used to represent like, the blood of Christ, like the blood of a lamb. It's 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 like a sacred animal, a representation of a sacred animal, right, if we're using that similarity. In the East Indian culture, the cow is a holy animal because it represents something for them. But they do not worship the cow. They don't put the cow on an altar and then they pray to the cow and they sing to the cow. That's not what happens here. right? It's just a sacred animal for them. But if you kill a cow or you eat beef, it is a sin for them. And, so, and it's by law. By law, several states in India have said, you cannot kill the cow. You cannot eat beef. And if you do, there will be legal consequences to doing that. Because for them, in, the, in their culture, the cow is a holy animal. The religion and culture of India appreciates and expresses his gratitude towards this innocent animal who gives back to Mother Earth and its people in more than one form. And what were these forms? Well, they believe that the cow is the representation of the earth and the cow gives back to the earth by producing manure that helps in agriculture and in energy and by producing milk, which helps to sustain life. And those are just one reason why they believe that the cow is a holy, holy animal. And then if you think about it, what other animal... Um, does the same, right? They could they could have chosen another animal, but they decided to choose the cow to be that holy cow for them. Um, at what time does our class finish? Anybody? I don't have my schedule here. Ten forty-five. Okay. So Ten thirty-five. Okay, we're good on time. I don't want. To talk too much and keep you guys after the time architecture the science behind the temple so now these these last ones are very quick and doesn't have a lot to it um when it comes to agri architecture most temples are located alongside man magnetic wavelengths and this is specifically in india right with the east indians and we have in belize they couldn't bring their your architecture but just one of the cultural practices that they have is that most of their tempers are temples are located along magnetic wave lines of earth which help in maximizing the availability of positive energy so if we go back and we think about the namaste people that do yoga they do the namaste and then when you're there are yoga poses where you put your hands together and then you raise one you stand on one feet they believe that they believe a lot in um, the art has positive and negative energy. And the way that they create their buildings and the, and the location that they create their buildings and with what material they make their buildings has a lot to do with the kind of energy that is inside of that building. 
So they have to carefully see where they're going to be creating these temples um, that they, they, they build to see that where I'm going to be building it, there is a lot of positive energy that will flow into this building. And by consequence, will flow into the people that are in the building. So that was one of their cultural practices. And it has to do with science. We're not going to leave the fact that science is not included because they do need to see the magnetic waves of the earth. And um, there are ways of doing that scientifically. But all of that plays a role um, in the location, determining where a specific temple is going to be created. And the temples that they do have created then those are placed in a specific location to allow this positive energy that they believe to flow into the building. Um, going into the temple often helps in having a positive mind and garnering positive energy, which in turn leads to healthier function. So they believe when you walk into this building, automatically your body absorbs this positive energy and you have a positive mind and you are gathering all of these positive energies so that when you walk out of this building you function much more better and physically you are healthier it is also a practice to take off footwear before entering places of worship because they would bring in dirt to an otherwise cleansed and sanctified environment. And just like um, the Asian race, they do also believe in removing your shoes before you walk into a, a room. You remove your shoes and then you put on sandals. But they in, in the East Indian culture, you remove your shoes and you walk in barefoot. And that also helps you to absorb more positive energy when you are in this building. And the arranged marriage system. The concept of arranged marriage in India traces its origin to as early as the Vedic times. And this was whoosh, so, so many centuries and centuries ago. And this all began with royal families. And because royal families would do this, then all of the families that were from the lower classes would also believe in the arranged marriage. For royal families, a ceremony known as the Swayambar would be arranged for the bride suitable matches from all over the kingdom and as i'm mentioning this is from centuries ago um you don't have a kingdom anymore um were invited to either compete in some competition to win over the bride and this is like what they do in movies when you have like the time of king arthur and all of those things and you see these things in movies where the king and the queen have a daughter and they're going to do like some sort of competition to see which of all of the men is the strongest, most suitable to marry the daughter. And this was what the um, East Indian culture were doing at the beginning as well. The first, first arranged marriages, this was what they were doing. The royalties did not have an option. You could not choose who you wanted to marry. You would choose who was the most suitable and ideal for you to marry based on the results of this competition that would take place, right? Even today, the concept of arranged marriage remains a favorite among Indians, and it is an integral part of the East, of the Indian tradition. Now, what happens here is that even today, if you notice about the East Indian cultures, they do not really intermarry. Rarely would you see an East Indian person that marries somebody that is not East Indian. They believe to only marry between their culture. And some people even have people, like some parents still believe in the idea of arranged marriage where they would call up somebody in India and say, okay, my daughter or my son, it's time for them to get married, but there is nobody suitable here in Belize. So they have somebody they either send their child over to India or whoever is going to be the suitable match comes here and marries them. And rarely, 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 and I stress in the word rarely, would you see somebody of the East Indian marry somebody that is Mestizo, for example, or somebody from a different culture um, from them. Um, the last one that I have here is the religious symbols. Um, and then that would be it. 
The Indian tradition and scriptures contain various symbols, signs and symbols which have multiple meanings. For example, using the um, swatika in the Indian concept does not point towards nas, narcissism or Adolf Hitler. And let me show you guys if you do not know what um, swa, this is the symbol in, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, right here. This is a symbol in the East Indian culture, all right? This one right here that has the little dots. But this is very, very similar to the one that is used by the Nazis. So it has no relation to each other, though. It doesn't mean that the Indians are Nazis, no. Or the Indians believe in, in Hitler, no. It's just coincidence. Um, I don't want to use the word coincidence. Um for some reason, um, it looks very similar, but the symbol for the East Indians has like the curves and the ends. If you notice the one for the Nazis, it's like straight lines. But the one for the um, East Indians has curves on the end and also has the dots in between the four, um, four lines. Um, so then for some reason they look very similar but they are they it has no relation at all right it is the symbol um of lord ganesha and this was another leader that they had um the removal the remover of obstacles the arms have several meanings various meanings they signify the four vedas the four constellations or the four primary aims of human pursuit and then uh, we're going to talk about um this if we have time next class just to get a, little, a more clear idea as to why this is one of the most symbolic religious symbols um so we have five minutes in the last five minutes i would like you guys to respond to one question in the chat, I would like you guys to list two of the East Indian cultural practices that we discussed today. And we discussed about, I think, five of them, five, six of them. But I would like you to choose two of them and only write this. You don't have to write the whole explanation. Just tell me. If you remember, we talked about the holy cow. Just put holy cow and whatever else. All right. So I'm going to give you guys a little time. Think about it. And when I count to three, everybody's going to send it together in the chat. All right. So think about it, list two of the East Indian cultural practices that we discussed today. Okay, at the count of three, one, two, three. The holy cow and namaste, okay. Okay, if you think the cow is holy, you have to compete to get the bride. <laughs> Holy cow, holy cow, namaste, namaste, holy cow, and namaste. Like, everybody just remember the holy cow and namaste. Let me have everybody send your response. The holy cow and namaste. Okay, let's see. The holy cow, namaste, namaste, the holy cow, competing to marry the bride, competition. 
I'm supposed to have 27 responses in the chat and I do not have 27. Let's see. I see um, Aziel, Daniel, Rusby, Tristan, Darnell, Efrain, Owen, Basilio, Jeannie, Zulemi, Angel, Hiram, Kimber, Eslin, Burton, Kaylee, and Nenel. Eladio. Okay, the holy cow and namaste. Okay, guys. Um, we are finished for today. Have a great rest of the day. And I will see you guys on Thursday. Okay? Bye. 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 Bye.